uh, what we're now about to discuss is the conservation strategies and reuse of concrete heritage. And with us today, we have a great panel, including Anton Wilmering from the Getty Foundation, Austra, I can't pronounce her last name. She'll have to, I, I tried before and I butchered it so badly, it's terrible. Um, but she's from the Vilnius Technical University and Barnabas Calder, the University of Liverpool. And we will be joined in the panel uh, after the presentations by Catherine Croft, who we heard from yesterday. So a little bit more on our speakers. Um, Anton Wilmering is a senior program officer at the Getty Foundation, where he oversees grant initiatives related to the conservation of cultural heritage around the world. Uh, his portfolio has included Keeping It Modern, which we're going to hear about, uh, and uh, many other things there. And before getting involved with uh, uh, the Getty, he was a conservator of wooden objects of the highest caliber. And uh, so he's, he's both uh, now an administrator, but he's actually also a, a very highly regarded conservator in his own right. And um, he's going to share with us a little bit today about this incredible program, the Keeping It Modern program uh, that the Getty has been doing. So Tom, you want to take it away? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Gunny, um, and thank you, Vidas, for organizing this meeting and for inviting me to speak. I'm going to share my screen. And that should give you my presentation. Um, is that looking okay? Looks great, yeah. Good. Well, it's a great pleasure being here, and um, I will take the next 10 minutes to talk about our um, international funding initiative, Keeping It Modern. But before I do so, um, I should give you a little bit of background about the Getty. Um, we are a, a non-governmental, uh, non-profit, uh, private operating foundation, and that's called the J. Paul Getty Trust. And under that trust, uh, there are four major programs that are um, well known in the field. Um, of course, one is our museum that's um, on site, and you see two images here, one at the Getty Center and one at the Getty Villa. Um, then we have an academic uh, art history research institute, a conservation institute, um, the Getty Conservation Institute, or GCI, as it is commonly known, and then the foundation. And um, we are actually the smallest program within the Getty. So we are a foundation within a foundation. And we fund in the areas where the Getty has uh, its interest. And that is in academic art history, in museums and in conservation. Not exclusively. I mean, we do sometimes, um, we also fund, for example, in the field, uh, professional development, and we, we support uh, organizations such as ICOMOS or um, uh, ICOMCC, so conservation organizations. Um, but our, our three main areas, that's where we develop strategic initiatives. And one of those strategic initiatives um, is Keeping It Modern, which we launched, launched in 2014 and um, last year, in 2020, we awarded our final um, grants for um, individual buildings and sites. The reason that we uh, began um, Keeping It Modern is twofold. On the one hand, um, the Getty Conservation Institute had started their Conservation of Modern Architecture initiative. And um, we felt that through keeping it modern, we could help um, solidify, help advance the idea that by supporting research and planning projects, um, that that would be a good strategy for advancing the field and adva advancing the thinking and the approach to the conservation of modern architecture. And especially our grants helped to separate the, the, the practice of research and planning as a separate effort from the implementation. And um, there's great benefit to doing that. And um, especially when you have funds to do that, 
you can really go deep. And I heard one of the previous speakers talk about the architect's intent. Um, and that's an important, uh, um, uh, that intent is important to consider when you preserve buildings. But of course, so is the materiality. And approach to, um, an approach to preserving buildings should probably be, or uh, might best be based in a blend or in a sort of blend of understanding um, how the material needs of a building um, fit in with the intent uh, of the architect, how he originally envisioned it. So um, I'm showing you some buildings from around the world um, that were supported by a Keeping It Modern grant. And, and of course, as I say, I will move the images away. I shouldn't do that. And um, the, uh, I, I sort of want to actually now go to the next slide and, and show the strategies that we um, applied for the Keeping in Modern initiative. Like I mentioned, we supported mostly um, research and planning grants, and especially those grants that focus on conservation management planning, where um, the, the method is that you, with, through stakeholder consultation, you distill what is the most significant about the site. So you create a statement of significance. From there, you then can uh, develop policies for the conservation and for the maintenance of your building. So it is a values-based approach to conservation. We supported also a few implementation grants. Um, we, uh, together with it, you know, organized by the 20th Century Society and um, content delivered by the GCI, we supported the convenings of grantees. And uh, that was, it's, it's, that was, this was actually a really interesting strategy where we, each year after we awarded a, a round of grants, we brought together one representative of the owner. So sometimes that was the facilities manager. Sometimes it was the, the director of an organization. And together with their main consultant on the conservation or the planning project. So there were pairs of participants. And we, uh, in London, then talked about issues of conservation management planning and visited um, sites in London where conservation plans are in action. And uh, as a result of these convenings, um, each year created themselves a cohort of grantees who remain connected to one another, um, as well as um, they seeking connections across the different years in which uh, Keeping in Modern grants were awarded. A final strategy that we employed, uh, and that's now live on our website, is a report library. Um, and this is where all the conservation reports of the different projects um, are um, collated. They can be downloaded at no charge. And I will show a few examples later on. Building you all very, know very well, of course, is Centennial Hall in Poland. Um, this was one of our first grants in 2014. And I pull this out, I mean, I know you're familiar with this building, but I pulled it out just to pause for a moment to consider the time in which it was built. So this is the very early 20th century. And when you look at this photograph of the, of the carpenters who were celebrating um, it, it, something in 1912 and Nine, uh, 1911 and 1912, it may be just the accomplishments of their form work, but to realize that all the form work was mostly created with hand tools. There was some me mechanization, and you can see on the right side here that there's a power drill held by one of the uh, men in the photographs. And there's, of course, a power saw here or a symbol of that, but mostly with hand tools. and. Um, History has it that these carpenters um, were unwilling to take out the formwork after the concrete had been poured because they were afraid that the building would collapse. 
And it was only after Burke himself went in to begin removing some of the formwork that then the building got re uh, revealed itself and revealed its strength. And I think in the uh, 2014 um, grant, and after they had done their research, they um, calculated that the building is basically, I think, four times overbuilt um, to carry the roof. So it's really, um, it's, it's a very strong building. Another grant um, of which you can see the report in our library is this incredibly beautiful uh, abbey by uh, Marcel Breuer in the United States. And um, they, uh, in their conservation plan, mostly focused on the bell tower. Um, I'm not going to uh, into too much detail in this uh, because we have little time, but the reports of these projects are available for download. So they can, uh, at your own time and your own leisure, you can um, review what has been done. We have several stadia that we were able to support, and, and one of, uh, of them is the Luigi Nervi Stadium at uh, the Stadio Flaminio in Rome. Um, there's Marine, uh, Miami Marine Stadium, which is concrete in direct contact with the seawater. Um, Yoyogi Stadium in uh, Japan, and of course, Patel Stadium in uh, India, that just received a grant in 2020. And next week, they will have um, a two-day symposium to actually talk about the significance of Patel Stadium and that's the first step toward their conservation management plan that they're preparing. Here are a few other examples, some br beautiful brutalist buildings in Boston, in Delft, in Cordoba, in Argentina. And then, um, um, I was gonna say Richard Meyer, but it's not, uh, it's Oscar Niemeyer in Lebanon. Um, although this is not brutalist architecture, it's the unfinished fairgrounds in Tripoli in, in Lebanon. Two implementation grants, one of which is um, uh, Unity Temple, a project that uh, Gunny is very familiar with, and one is the Salk Institute. And we only awarded very few uh, implementation grants because um, we wanted, you know, we, we had set for ourselves that the standards had to be really high at the highest level, to be frank, and the applicants had to demonstrate that all the research and planning had been done before uh, moving into implementation. And because the, these projects were uh, are uh, exemplary in their approach and in their research to making the repairs and therefore they were awarded uh, their grants. I also wanted to take this opportunity to share with you the work that our colleagues are at, at the Getty Conservation Institute are do doing. Um, as I mentioned, they started the Conservation of Modern Architecture Initiative in 2012. And since then they have created this really great resource um, for the field through um, their lectures that they're giving to the research they're doing and to the publications that they're making. And um, three of the publications uh, related to concrete. Um, one is a literature review on concrete heritage. One is a case studies book on concrete uh, uh, written, uh, co-written by uh, Catherine Croft. And then um, there is a new principles or guidance, uh, guidelines, um, if you will, for uh, preserving concrete. And here's a little bit more detail um, about that approach. What I want to call out most specifically, and I mentioned it already a few times, is the Keeping It Modern Report Library. And um, when you go there, currently there are 33 projects in the library, and we'll keep adding as um, the, the grantees finish their uh, research and, and begin publishing their work. We will add these reports to the library. Um, in particular, I would like to call out the concrete conservation strategy of uh, uh, Sydney Opera House. Um, Sydney Opera House 
has already or had already in place some excellent conservation management plans and they update it every five or, 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 or 10 years, but they realized that they had concrete, con uh, concrete issues that needed to be addressed in the building. Um, um, concrete that was directly in contact with the, uh, with the seawater, um, concrete under the sails of the, to which they have not much uh, direct access and they couldn't really assess the condition of the concrete, and then in other parts of the building as well. And uh, the results are, um, were exem exemplary and they're well recorded in the report. And I would highly recommend that, that you look at that as, as a download. Um, and then the la my last slide is just to say thank you. And um, I'm gonna conclude here. And, and I will put in the chat um, a link to the library, should you be interested in looking at the reports and, and downloading them. Thank you, Gunny. I'm going to conclude with this. So. That was wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and uh, I, have, I have some questions for you, but I'm going to wait till we go to the panel before I, I do that. Um, okay. Um, so next up, is, uh, is Ausra. Are you ready? Ausra, let me, get, I'm sorry, I, I've, I need to uh, give a little background on Ausra. She, she uh, defended her PhD thesis on concrete architecture in Lithuania uh, this year, 2021, and she's a practicing architect as well. She co-authored uh, the list of valuable architecture of the 1945 to 1990s in Lithuania. So she is the expert on concrete heritage in Lithuania. And uh, we're very excited to have you here and to hear about uh, the post-war housing because housing, and, and, and this is something that um, Catherine commented on in her, her keynote as well as, I think we'll hear a little bit from Barnabas, but housing is a very complicated and challenging issue all over the world. Uh, and particularly in the former Eastern uh, Bloc, where uh, so much of it was created in that post-war period. So, Ausra, please proceed. So, thank you, Gunny, for the introduction, and hello to everyone. Um, I really want to thank Vidas, who asked me to talk about the situation um, of... Uh, of uh, concrete uh, heritage in uh, Lithuania. And, uh, and today my talk uh, will be about post-war concrete housing uh, in Lithuania. So um, uh, then uh, the first idea was really to talk about the challenges of, um, of, um, of the reuse of iconic public buildings. But later on, I decided to talk uh, about post-war housing as it is a very specific part of concrete heritage, uh, which is often left uh, in outskirts uh, uh, about the discussions of 20th century heritage. So uh, yeah, post-war housing is my target today and uh, is certainly a very abundant and uh, a very controversial part of concrete heritage in Lithuania and I think in all Eastern Bloc as well. So abundant because um, almost half of Lithuanians still live in the post-war concrete housing and controversial because it covers mass housing districts uh, mm -hmm. implementing, uh, implemented using uh, typical buildings made of uh, prefabricated concrete panels, which are often seen as monotonous concrete boxes similar everywhere. But in reality, Mm, the urban and architectural solutions of these uh, of these districts are extremely diverse. And for example, one third of uh, Vilnius territory is covered by mass housing districts and uh, built uh, during Soviet period. And uh, every district has a unique uh, composition of buildings, color solution, and details as balconies uh, uh, or entrance panels. So. As well, um, almost every district district uh, was uh, supplemented by apartment towers made of cast-in-situ concrete designed individually 
for each district and these iconic concrete towers uh, became an important part of uh, townscapes and the symbols of 20th century architecture in Lithuania. And you, and you now see several examples uh, of them and uh, really no, none of the apartment towers is on the heritage list yet. But really in public opinion, these towers considered as gray, concrete monstrosities to use uh, uh, John's Greenrod's words, and in the negative association with shortages of Soviet era. And uh, the aesthetic non-appreciation is not the only challenge that concrete uh, mass uh, housing uh, meets. Um, and as the young heritage, uh, it is not properly evaluated. And it is still, uh, as it is still a short time distance, I think, to rethink what we mean in a historical perspective. And uh, buildings also don't meet the needs of contemporary society. They are um, of poor energy class. They are poor, uh, poorly insulated, has too little open space and poor quality of the surrounding environment. And some of the issues are related as well to poor physical condition due to a poor maintenance, poor labor skills and shortage, shortage of materials during the construction in Soviet times. And uh, other challenges are, are monofunctional solutions and rigid structure, which is really hard to transform and uh, of course lack of skills to repair the concrete and uh, all these challenges really straightly lead to collapse and demolition list, uh, risk or poor renovation scenarios and um, the renovation process of concrete towers uh, has started in the beginning of the century in Lithuania and this spot was a very good illustration of, of it. One of the first innovation is seen on the left uh, and um, it was done really without the regard to specific features of the concrete architecture and original design like rounded corners, color solution, solutions were just ignored. And the tower in the middle was updated really several years ago and as well just repainting balcony in dark gray and which is in original design were beautifully yellow. And the view of the nearest tower shows uh, really the importance of good maintenance of buildings. Like due to lack of it, the heavy concrete balcony partition fell down from the 15th floor in last summer and damaged the lower apartments. So fortunately no one was at home and no one was hurt, but um, Really, the bad maintenance is very bad thing for concrete architecture. So another renovation was carried out for so-called New York dormitories in Vilnius when the really renovation project was presented to the public. A very critical reaction raised um, as the project proposed to remove uh, the triangular balconies, um, arguing that they were unsafe and unuseful. So an active community of architects and researchers immediately has uh, sparked uh, the public discussion, post-war architecture as cultural heritage. And in such way, they proved uh, the significance of these buildings and uh, really helped to preserve the identity of the buildings. So yeah, concrete uh, post-war housing meets really a lot of challenges. But uh, on the other hand, it meets opportunities as well. And first of all, we were designed as a part of the bigger complexes, I mean concrete towers. We are in good and close connection uh, to city center. Complexes are spacious and green. They are, we have all infrastructure is needed in walkable distance. So I mean public and commercial centers, schools and kindergartens, libraries, etc. So huge potential really lays in the improvement of the surrounding areas. And um, talking about, uh, uh, about rehabilitation 
opportunities of towers themselves. It could be related to the expansion of the ground floor apartments, uh, improvement of uh, communication zones and visual appearance, keeping com concrete specifics. And I think the main task of the rehabilitation scenario is really to find uh, what is good and valuable and to, to think what we can add, what is missing. If we think, if we still think sustainably, so, and uh, during my research, I, I really had de developed four criteria for evaluation and successful rehabilitation of concrete architecture as uh, complexity, innovation, variety, and small scale design, as well as uh, uh, as well as triggers or, or agents for rehabilitation pr process as. Uh, local initiatives, uh, active social society groups and various projects, which really help to draw attention to important and forgotten issues. So as in the case of Sheshkina Towers, for example, the local people themselves find uh, ways uh, how to expand the ground floor apartments. Or in case of New York, active so society of architects really uh, reacted on time and saved the identity of the first high-rise apartment buildings in Lithuania. And of course, various research and practice-based uh, uh, practice uh, project like this project, Innova Concrete, which uh, help uh, really to ensure wider knowledge uh, and uh, in theoretical and practical sense. And for example, uh, in theoretical level, uh, several years ago, we with uh, colleagues worked on the project, the list of available post-war architecture in Lithuania and uh, several prominent uh, objects of concrete housing we included on the list. And uh, this list was uh, really presented at, at conferences and uh, exhibition of the objects uh, was organized. So now we are working uh, on the publication of this list. So. Another good news for Vilnius is that Vilnius municipality have just started their project uh, City Plus, which really has a very ambitious goal to revive uh, all mass housing districts till 2030, improve the building, surrounding environment and infrastructure as well to create the identity of each district. But really I was listening to the presentation and didn't hear a single word about the existing identity of the district, so about the intention to preserve valuable elements uh, like apartment towers. So hopefully it's, it is a very beginning of the project and such issues will be included in nearest future. So that's it from me today and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. That that last uh, slide is is concerning, but also an opportunity, I guess. So uh, we look forward to to seeing how you can influence the positive outcome of that. And we'll come back. Maybe we'll come back to that in the discussion. Um, so uh, next, and I, I I encourage all those of you that are out there listening to to send us your questions and comments because we we want to make sure to include that in the discussion that we're going to have uh, shortly after Barnabas Calder gives his presentation. Uh, Barnabas is an author and a, a, a teacher. He's a, he's a professor in, at the University of Liverpool. His previous book called Raw Concrete was my introduction to him. I, we met uh, at one of the Getty sessions that um, Tan was discussing in London, and we had a, a, a really great um, presentation by you then. And uh, Barnabas has just released, I mean, just like this week or last week or next week, it's just right now, um, called Architecture from Prehistory to Climate Emergency. And uh, Barnabas is going to share with us some ideas about sustainability and uh, the particular challenges with concrete buildings. How do we um, how do we address that now and, and as we move forward? So Barnabas, 
Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm sad to have missed a lot of your wonderful event because I've been chairing another conference uh, on the subject of the relationship between architectural history and things we can learn about the climate emergency, which is proving really interesting. Uh, there's more of it next week. If any of you are uh, looking for more conference to go to, the Society of Architectural Historians of Great Britain, it's, it's going into some really interesting things. Uh, I think today that my uh, paper will have, or my brief contribution, will have a lot more American and British material uh, than perhaps um, some of your earlier contributions, uh, and may therefore have elements of a different experience of these very wealthy countries dealing with their post-war heritage. But I fear there are some things enormously in common, like the fact that most people don't like it. Uh, it's probably incomprehensible to anyone who's chosen to spend their Saturday at this event that so many people could fail to understand what miraculous stuff reinforced concrete is. It's extraordinary accomplishments in engineering terms, and it's amazing profile as a building material that revolutionized the ways in which you could construct, the ways in which you could imagine cities and buildings in the course of the 20th century, particularly in the post-war decades where these technologies and the engineering understanding for them uh, really developed to maturity. But the thing that I think causes the most difficulties with the public's appreciation of concrete, or in so many cases the public's utter loathing of concrete, is its surface. Its surface is certainly in the UK and the USA widely misunderstood by the general public as being craftless and industrial. I think this is in some ways the naughtiest technical and aesthetic problem with the conservation of concrete. Uh, the huge scientific and craft challenge of maintaining and restoring a material that's so uh, difficult in some ways to keep looking and performing uh, at its best. You must be constantly dogged as you work your socks off on these difficult issues by people asking the question, why bother? by people who don't care, don't understand why you would care, can't understand why it would be worth spending money on, can't understand why you wouldn't just overclad the whole thing to improve its thermal performance, for example. I think many of us, and more by the year, know that it's worth your effort and are very grateful to those of you who are dedicating your careers to uh, looking after the world's great concrete buildings. But there's an awful lot of people who still don't get it. They don't understand with a scheme like the Barbican in London that I'm showing here, looking up at the 42-story residential triangular towers with this extraordinary dramatic profile. But when they see that little bit of rain patina, uh, or dirt if you want to call it that, I don't mind the pejorative term being used, on the balconies, uh, they think that's something going wrong, they think it's something that needs a good lick of beige paint to cheer it up, or that it needs pulling down. In fact, the concrete at the Barbican is not untypically of many British and American projects extraordinarily meticulous. And I don't claim any unique monopoly for Britain and America on this. It's just that that's the history I know by far better. Uh, and if you look at this concrete, it's been cast to include all the elements that need to appear that uh, need to functionally be present in the building, but to turn them into a kind of Aztec sculpture about fire extinguishers, speakers, and air vents, that because they've denied themselves the permission to add decoration, they've turned these functional elements into something beautiful. But to do so is so much harder than putting a lick of plaster and paint over all the messy servicing. The, the servicing has to be designed in from the start in this enormous complex building, and Every wiring run needs to be cast into the structural concrete while you're doing the big, initial, challenging structural job. This is harder than the conditions that the builders of the Parthenon imposed on themselves. They allowed themselves to add the fluting last to their columns because they knew 
that there'd have been lots of messy building work going on in the meantime, and it would get chipped otherwise. With the great projects of the 1960s, the structural work surface is the final surface of the finished building. And that's an enormously challenging thing to impose on yourselves. The quantity surveyors for the National Theatre here uh, said in later years that it would have been cheaper to clad the entire building in marble than to do it to the quality of concrete that they did it to. This is a close up of the concrete. Look at the level of wood grain they've managed to get into that by uh, shot blasting the wood once they cut it. They, they allowed it to dry out more than usual before they cut it. They cut it with a very rough rip saw and then they shot blasted it to get this extraordinarily strong grain out of it. And then they only used each piece twice because more than that, and the, the cement starts to clog the grain and smooth it out. And what they wanted was this incredibly strong feeling of the wood in the finished building. I remember looking at this as a small child in the 1980s when this building was universally hated in Britain, uh, thinking, what is it? Because it feels like stone, but it looks like wood. And people will only tell me that it's ugly. And yet it's totally enthralling. A later discovery for me was the astonishing Paul Rudolph, uh, America's greatest post-war architecture, uh, with um, all respect to Louis Kahn. Uh, and uh, this building is produced by corrugating the concrete in rubber matting and then hand smashing it with a hammer. This is not a material that is indifferently mass produced by some mysterious and heartless uh, industrial process. This is a truly loved handmade material of the highest quality. And with it, he produces this astounding landscape of kind of concrete toadstools and mysterious shapes uh, folding through this building down to a staircase of such outrageous Baroque expressiveness that Michelangelo might have thought it was a bit much. It's not popular, however, with the locals. There's a world uh, elite of brutalist admirers who know and love this building, but if you ask your average Bostonian, they don't like it. Possibly because of this marvelous uh, concrete frog that looks down at you as you walk past and threatens to devour you, uh, or possibly just because it's all so big and gray and formidable. And this building is under imminent threat of partial demolition. And when I went to one of the meetings about it, which happily was on Zoom and therefore I could crash it uh, and made the case for the aesthetic of the building, it was responded to with the way that public meetings respond when somebody says we should all be wearing foil hats to stop the aliens controlling us. I was regarded as just some eccentric voice that needed to be moved on from. Almost worse than that, however, are the many, many buildings where they're not even admired by the architectural history and heritage world. This was a rather nice art school building in Glasgow. And it had, again, a really uh, painstaking and interesting concrete texture, which brought together the National Theatre's board marked concrete and Paul Rudolph's hand smashed ridges of concrete in this extraordinary kind of Le Corbusier like barcode effect. Uh, and there were people in the art school who appreciated it. One of the textile designers who studied in it made her final submission into a uh, textile based on this concrete texture, which I absolutely loved. But the School of Art itself did not appreciate it, and it was demolished. And the wastefulness of this, both in cultural terms and in sustainability terms, is absolutely shocking and disgusting. But it's been successful for the School of Art. It was in many ways the right thing for the people who did it to do. Uh, it freed them from taxation because our ridiculous taxation system in this country taxes uh, maintenance of existing buildings but doesn't tax their demolition and replacement, which is deranged. Uh, it uh, has produced them a new building that looks very pretty and gets on all their prospectuses. And the new building is named after the head of school who took the decision to get rid of the old building and put up the new one. So everybody feels as though they've won from it. But meanwhile, this excellent old building has been replaced entirely unnecessarily by a new building. And with the most enormous waste of energy and environmental carbon dioxide as a result. But even more than the quite nice buildings of this period, we need to be thinking about all buildings of concrete and steel as things that we need to keep if we can. 
At the moment, 50% of all raw materials mined and harvested in the entire planet go into construction. 39% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are from the construction and operation of buildings. 8% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are from cement production. We cannot afford to carry on building concrete buildings. We must keep the ones we have. I have a student, Rowena Cray, who's doing a PhD on the embodied energy of 1960s concrete buildings. And it's at a very early stage, but it's already starting to indicate the immense embodied carbon of this huge building boom. And that carbon will still be up in the atmosphere for another thousand years. So why are we throwing out these still robust buildings, pulling them down in the service of a property market that makes more profit to do so, but no other advantage accruing? And what we're replacing them with, this building claims to be the first eco-development in Liverpool, the city from which I'm speaking to you. And it claims as well that they're planting 45,000 trees in the Amazon rainforest. As far as I'm aware, that's not what the Amazon rainforest needs, artificial tree planting. It needs preservation. But if we leave that aside, the, uh, this claim that it's the first eco-development in Liverpool is given a, an obvious falsehood by the fact that it's an enormous new steel building where another building that could have been refurbished, I'm sure, has just been demolished. And they, the new building will never repay in energy savings the energy cost of replacing it, the carbon cost of replacing it. So what we need to be doing at the moment is keeping all the existing concrete buildings we possibly can and reusing them. Zero carbon architecture finds it really difficult to achieve large scale, rigidity, fireproofing and wide spans. Concrete architecture finds that very easy. We can't afford in carbon terms to put up new concrete architecture. So what on earth are we doing pulling down so much of our existing concrete architecture? There are uncountable hundreds of thousands of existing robust concrete buildings worldwide with these properties. And we need to physically conserve them the way that you're working brilliantly to achieve, but also as a big part of the battle to help people who don't realize how special this period of architecture was to love it as much as we do. To realize that the 20th century's modernist concrete architecture was in many ways the most optimistic, creative, progressive, the most outstanding moment in the entire long history of architecture. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Barnabas, uh, for your rousing enthusiasm. And uh, it's, it's infectious. I, I wish we could bottle it. I, I think that your, your books are one way to transmit it, but it doesn't come out the same way as, as hearing you talk about it. And uh, you're absolutely right. We, we need to find a way to appreciate these buildings at least at the level of what they provide us as a basis to do something else. Um, you know, when, when the, the qualities are, are maybe not at the highest level of their heritage, you know, like the f surface textures of a, of a, of a Breuer building, for example, you know, you can't, that's much more hard to deal with because it's both inside and outside in many cases. And, uh, uh, how do you deal with it? poor insulation and things like that, or, or, or um, uh, thermal breaks and this and that? It's very difficult to deal with that. But nonetheless, there are many examples of that, like the ones you show, where it's just a shell. You can do a lot in there and not damage its values. So, uh, really, really inspirational. And we'll come back to that in a second. But first, I want to start with my, my, my question to Tom, because in all cases where we have, uh, in particular, heritage buildings, um, good heritage practice tells us that we really need to take the time and spend the money to understand what we've got. And uh, the Getty has done an incredible job in and getting people to realize the importance of this planning, this initial planning to say, okay, we have a building, we know we need to do something with it, how do we proceed? And the first best step is to do something like 
if not an exact conservation management plan. How do we understand what we've got? How do we plan for the change that's going to come, whether it's climate change or development pressures or need to adapt it to some other use? You have to be able to manage whatever that change that's going to come, because it is going to come, whether it's today or 20 years from now. So you've set an incredibly high standard, and it's important that you did that um, over the course of the six or seven years that the, the Keeping It Modern program was in, in, in place. And fortunately, the Getty is a, is a foundation or is, is funded through the trust that had monies to do that. But now all the poor children are running around with their hands out saying, we need we need to do this, but I can't raise two hundred thousand uh, dollars locally or from our poor um, existing institution. We don't have that money to do this. How do we get them? How do we find ways for them to still be able to commit to best practices uh, when they're challenged just to have enough money to run whatever their organization might be? That's a, a, a very good question, Gunny. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, uh, Keeping in Modern was originally planned for five years, and we added two years uh, to it. But we started to um, see that, the, that the, the consultants themselves, plus the grantees, they began to form their own groups. They identified strongly with Keeping It Modern as almost as a brand um, that we had not intended. And we saw that the field was beginning uh, to share lessons learned, to share approaches. And in fact, I think that practitioners in the field are beginning to adapt to um, separating out uh, research and planning from implementation. Um, so that, that was for us an indicator that we had created the momentum and that we could step back as a funder. Um, that, and, and that is one consideration. The other consideration is that we uh, have not unlimited funds. And whenever we uh, begin an initiative, we know that uh, for five or six years, we probably spend a million or between one and two million each year. And for Keeping It Modern, we actually spent 12, uh, 12 and a half million dollars over seven years. And when we do that though, that money is used. It's, it's, uh, it's going there for that purpose, which means that we cannot uh, respond to any other demands of the field. And um, because we, you know, our funds are not unlimited, and we we have an annual budget in the foundation of about nine million dollars, so that gets um, used toward grants to museums, grants for um, uh, art historical research, uh, convenings, um, and conservation related grants. So it is a, it's also sort of an economic measure that you know we we fund for a number of years and then we stop so that we can free up our funds to support other initiative, uh, initiatives or other projects. Well, we're certainly grateful for what you've been able to do with it because I think it has had an incredible uh, uh, impact and that, that the profession and all the um, folks that are in need see the see the reason for it i just i i know from our own professional uh practice that the need is much greater than the ability to comply shall we say so uh, we'll see how that all plays out but um as professionals we continue to to beat the drum to our clients that that this is a really necessary step to take and that if you want to spend your hard-earned dollars uh, wisely you do need a good plan otherwise you're just going to go around fixing the cracks or patching the holes or uh, spraying the insulation where it isn't necessarily needed uh, i'm exaggerating but that's kind of what it amounts to so right um no, and uh, gunny you're absolutely right and i think that 
you know, by if, if building owners and stewards begin to understand that if they would invest a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand into creating a conservation plan or a conservation management plan, that will help them in the future with um, planning the uh, maintenance or planning conservation work, and actually can be a cost saving way. I mean, when, when you plan it carefully and you know that you have to do um, cyclical maintenance in certain ways, you can budget, you can, um, you know, save money over time. Yep. yep, that's the message we try to send. Uh, Barnabas and, and Ausra, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at a question to, to sort of connect your two worlds because they're really, uh, I don't know if it's a collision course, but they certainly are, they are both in the same realm in the sense that, that with the realization of the need for uh, housing to upgrade, just to make it more habitable for people's standards in the 21st century, um, wherever they are, whether it's in, in Lithuania or in Czechoslovakia or in South America or wherever, because this stuff was built all over the world uh, uh, in a very similar fashion. I mean, one interesting thing is a success, uh, it's seemingly successful way that Lithuania is addressing this, uh, whereas in the United States, we tear this stuff down as quick as we can, and uh, both because it had a sociological failure, uh, much of it was used as low-income housing, as we call it, and that proved to not be very successful. There are some successes, but not, not enough. Um, but they all have the same problem, and they were built in the 60s and 70s where oil was cheap. Nobody cared about how much heat you pumped into these things. Air conditioning was uh, new and also very inefficient. Um, and now we have to deal with, with how to make them function better. And I know that, Barnabas, you've been very engaged with us, not just in the, in the embodied energy issue, but also in how do we find ways to improve these performance. It's, it's about building performance, holistic performance. And Alshra, I'm, I'm assuming that this is also something that, um, while not a historical issue, but it is something that's a practical issue and that you need to be able to communicate to the authorities that they can still find ways to marry those two things, to, to value the heritage while making them better. Either one of you can take that or comment on that. Can, can I kick in there? Sure, sure. Catherine, yes, please. <laughs> Um, I mean, I was really interested to know whether those Lithuanian tar blocks were generally being overclad um, with insulation. I couldn't really tell from your photographs because I do think that it's it's very difficult to, to upgrade without doing that. Um, not least because it means disturbing the people inside the flats um, and logistically becomes much, much harder than doing something external. I think in Britain, we've um, all been brought up short and have had to um, stop and think because we had this terrible fire, the Grenville fire, Tower fire, about three years ago now, um, where um, exterior cladding, which was all looking new and sparkly, and I think kind of rebranding um, a partic not particularly successful tower block, um, was responsible for, for this very fast spread of fire um, and enormous loss of life. So I think cladding in the UK has got a real negative connotation now, not least because a lot of people are not able to sell their f properties because um, there are huge um, insurance um, things going on about um, you know, who's going to pay for replacing um, cladding that doesn't meet fire protection standards. So, so I mean, I think here we've kind of perhaps uniquely got that, um, that specific reason for us to, to, to stop and think about um, whether there are alternatives to, to overcladding. Um, and um, I mean, I, I'm really keen to, to see good examples of, of, of how people have done that and wherever. Um, and the, the other thing that we are, are, are faced with is um, an, an enormous pressure to provide more housing. So that for the lot of these estates, they're being really damaged by infill blocks on every bit of available ground that was meant to be beautifully landscaped and enjoyed by the people who lived in them. You know, with more and more and more um, housing is being crammed onto already fairly dense sites. 
Um, and um, I think it's, it's, it's very hard to, um, in the campaigning terms, it's really, really hard to um, resist those sorts of applications. Yeah. Alistair or Barnabas, you have a thought or comment? Barnabas? Yeah, uh, I think um, this, this is fairly uh, case by case, that different aspects of the quite wide range of different design ideas that get explored uh, during the period of peak uh, concrete structured public housing in this country uh, means that in some cases there are relatively easy fixes and in some cases it's quite challenging uh, and it requires response building by building but the uh, that's the pattern of retrofit generally that retrofit is uh, more expensive than replacement sometimes uh, certainly per amount of work involved uh, but it's much more sustainable, not merely because you don't demolish what you've already got, but because new build tends to be performed by system built industrial produced uh, high energy materials from the other side of the world being shipped over. Whereas retrofit tends to be performed by local designers and local craftspeople working on that specific building in a way that's very one off. And uh, that therefore requires a change of mindset and a change of understanding of the economic effects of development where we recognize that what we're trying to avoid is the carbon expenditure not the financial expenditure and we recognize that employing large quantities of skilled and semi-skilled labor from local area is actually itself a social good and uh, therefore things like internal wall insulation which is complex and messy and building by building and flat by flat uh, needs to become a much bigger part of our economy and importing kit built Lego systems of high energy materials, aluminium, plastic and uh, steel and glass from all over the, the world's um, coal consuming industrial countries needs to become a much smaller part of our building sector. So it's a huge shift, but uh, it's one without which the problems are going to be much greater than the problems of um, the kind of face value problems of having difficulty restoring this generation of building. Thank you. Uh, I'm getting word on the, the thing, the chat that we're supposed to wrap up here. I'm, I hate to do it because I, I think it's a really interesting discussion. I will give uh, Alsra an opportunity to have a final comment if you would like to add something before we wrap it up. So, yeah, so I really agree with Catherine and we have really to stop and to think what to do with, with this concrete uh, housing heritage. And uh, I think uh, cladding is not uh, the proper renovation type for, for concrete towers, especially because, uh, because you, you lose uh, a lot of valuable elements by doing that. And... Um, I don't have really answer how to do it, to do it right, but, um, but we are talking about it and uh, looking for uh, answers, I think, in this discussion. Well, one, one thing is that we need to make sure that the surfaces of these concrete buildings are, are conserved in a way that allows them to to go on because oftentimes you know you get the surface spalling and it, it just becomes a sort of a, a, a snowball effect as we say and uh hopefully i mean one of the main purposes of the innova concrete initiative is to find ways to help with that problem i'm not saying it's going to cure all that but it might help help do some good so that people then can really appreciate in, in, its, in the way that Barnabas described it so richly and beautifully, uh, and they can have a different attitude about it. So that, this is all about shifting attitudes, and every little bit we can do with a meeting like this and these other meetings going on, uh, and just keep proselytizing as much as we can to, to get people to realize that these are things that we need to save. Not, not, not everything in its existing way, but, but a lot of it, uh, 
needs to be saved and then some of it needs to be celebrated and that's what we're talking about here is the celebration of those things that really deserve it thank you all so much for your contributions uh i learned a lot like i always do 